All right, welcome back, everybody. I'm so excited today. I've got two amazing people with me today. I have Dr. Steve Chin, who's the author of This Little Lovely Number. It's one of my favorite books on the planet. And I think you've already seen me gush about it in a different video. And another one that I happen to have is The Trouble with Maths. And he's been an author of many books, an editor where he gathered a lot of really great um, research and put it all in one resource. So I've got Steve Chin with me today, but I also have the lovely Amy Anderson who works with me here at Made for Math and she works one-to-one -one with students. And the reason why we have these two together with us today is Amy is currently a student in Dr. Steve Chin's classes and she's been learning and studying underneath him. And I'm just thrilled to have you both. So we're gonna be talking about all the things that indicate struggles um, for these particular students and your expertise, Dr. Chen. Um, but I would love to hear first, how did you get into this work? Okay, well, um, serendipity. <laughs> <laughs> um, I lived in the wilds of Somerset. I know they're not as wild as you can manage in the, in the US. And um, we had a little bitty school, tiny little bitty school. And a guy bought it, um, well-known educator in the UK, and he opened a school for dyslexics there, up to the age of 12. And um, then I learned he was going to extend the age range to 16, which is a key age in England, mm -hmm. to take a national exam. I applied for the job and got it with no experience, no nothing. I'm just, a, I was a good administrator, you know? <laughs> and um, my, he said, well, you're a scientist, teach them maths. Um, no one knew anything about this lecture of maths in England back in the early 80s. And I just was hooked from the start. I was shocked by how poor a teacher I was. I thought I was very good. That was nothing, you know, just because I had good feedback, nothing to do with having a big ego. And then I got in front of these lovely young, these young, lovely young lads, and they just proved I was useless. <laughs> so I thought, this is a challenge. <laughs> and it's still going. <laughs> the challenge is still going 40 years later. <laughs> I love that. And I think you obviously discovered that students with dyslexia struggle with learning math as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you started discovering that, what was your plan of action to figure out how to help these kiddos? <laughs> well, my plan of action was to teach a lesson that they understood. <laughs> oh, that would be a good start. Um, and I I really had to learn on the job, as we say in, in, in the UK. Um, and they just fascinated me because, you know, I've subsequently read so much stuff. And a lot of that stuff says, if you want to learn how to teach, listen to your students. Yeah. You know? And that wasn't a culture that we had in England in the 1980s. And then I got the offer of running a school in Baltimore, mm. in Maryland, and which, of course, is the home of Johns Hopkins. And I did some, so I took a job. I took a job to run the school. I had to give up my English job mm. and um, studied a bit at Hopkins. The two guys that owned the school were very good, learned a lot from them. And so I was really, really into this and excited by the fact that you could change the learning pattern of your students. And uh, so many dyslexics have trouble with maths, not all, but so many of them do. And so there was always uh, someone I could teach and some kids I could learn from. And, and Johns Hopkins, I mean, this is, predates all the technology we have now. Yeah. If you wanted to learn anything, you had to go into the library and find a book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it all seems so quaint. <laughs> that's course, amazing. Uh, so that, that's the early story. So I know in your book, you mentioned that um, Dr. Joyce Steves, uh, you mentioned her and some of the work yes, that she did. Yes. 
So did you ever get to meet her when you were over here? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I took a course with her oh. at Johns Hopkins. And of course, she's a Brit. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we, we, we under, I didn't have to focus as much on the language because you Americans have strange accents. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. <laughs> I, I think some of you thought I had, but of course that was a misconception. <laughs> oh, I totally uh, agree. Well, you, we sound weird. <laughs> <laughs> I had, I used to um, adjust my accent slightly. But Joy, yeah, Joy Steves was wonderful to work with, of course. Well, that's um, amazing. That she, yeah, and the fact that she was British was kind of like an actual, um, a little bonus. The mayor of Baltimore um, at that stage was a Brit, but unfortunately not one that one could be too proud of. She got a <laughs> bit got a bit of a bad reputation. <laughs> That's a bummer. Well, Dr. Steves, we actually use her lesson plan that she taught uh, yeah. here with our students. We love her work. We think it's amazing. So, um, so Amy and I have studied a lot of your work and people that are unfamiliar with it should definitely go check out that book. But one of my favorite chapters that just spoke to my heart was about the potential difficulties that students with dyslexia or dyscalculia are dealing with when they're struggling with math. And there was a long string of things, but they were definitely things that we see. I would love to discuss some of those with you, the areas that kind of pop yeah. up and cause issues for them. Yeah. Sure, I'd be happy for that. Are you going to start or? Should yeah, we? sure. I would love to learn more about um, like the directionality, the confusion that comes from navigating math problems, because it's not all left to right. <laughs> no, um, what, one of the big issues for, for dyslexics, uh, well, any learner actually, is inconsistency. Um, anything that's inconsistent is, is a real worry particularly if you're an, an uncertain and insecure learner, you want things to be predictable. And uh, you, you kind of think, well, well, you know that spelling in the English language is, is appalling. It's, it's so many things that are bad about it. Um, and you, got, you kind of think, my maths is going to be much more reliable. Um, <laughs> it's going to be something that won't create problems. But in fact, that's not true, and um, particularly with younger learners. And it's, it's the stuff you learn in the early stages of learning that really controls how you'll progress later on. So the first time you get to a two digit number, um, you get 11 and 12, which are neither here nor there, there's no pattern. But then you say 13, which kind of implies three and 10, and then you write one three. And then so that's really, a, really a, a big problem. And um, counting backwards, which is sort of linked very closely. Um, there was a Russian psychologist um, way back in the 60s I can talk about Russians in the 60s, um, who uh, wrote a book about being gifted at maths. And he listed, I think, 10 things. And one of them was reversing. Mm. So this ability to turn something around uh, and, and say it backwards was very, very important. Um, so yeah, knowing left from right, which way place value goes is it's a big challenge yeah. and all all the time if you don't listen and you don't analyze you won't learn how to teach your students and yeah. that you know it, it, that sounds analyze obviously it's quite a sophisticated word but it, it's just looking for the errors and not just saying it's wrong thinking, why is this wrong? Why have they written 31 for 13? Well, you can work that out, you know? Um, and with equations, you know, um, when you chain sides, you chain sign. There are lots of sort of 
of those mnemonic type things in maths, which don't offer an, expla an explanation, but do address things like that inability to distinguish left from right. Absolutely. And then another well, thing that you cited was visual difficulties. Um, and Amy, sorry, did I interrupt you? Did you have a question about that? <laughs> Oh, no, I just had a comment. Long division is the perfect example of where that directionality and the confusion a lot of the times comes in. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. I um, very carefully um, mock um, a celebrity who teaches maths and explains division. <laughs> I just look at it and I laugh. I think, have you ever worked with a child? <laughs> <laughs> you know that bit when you when you carry a number over, you say we're dividing 92, and you say, well, how many, by four, how many fours in nine? Well, there are two, but there's one left over. We put it here, and you think, where's here? Because <laughs> it's not a 10, it's not a one, it's somewhere in the middle. And it's not a five, you know, which would be in the middle. <laughs> so, yeah, and there's a lot of that writing this way and then writing down. And you're absolutely right, Amy. It's, uh, and we just assume if we say it slow enough and loud enough. <laughs> and a hundred times that it is like one times. of those times. That'll but yeah, yeah I, I, I heard... Um, Professor Sharma say something like, I'll fail you once and I'll fail you again and then 17 more times. And and I tried to expect you're gonna get it, but it's not it's not correct. It, you need to try um, something different. Well, <laughs> it, it is, and it kind of implies that the fault lies with the learner, not exactly. with the teacher. <laughs> exactly. You need to find another way to to yeah. approach that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's um I don't know. You, you kind of hear such things in everyday life. Not to do with maths, you know, um, parents telling their children something several times and thinking that'll do it, <laughs> you know, when they're in the street <laughs> and uh, put that teddy down, that teddy, put it down, you know, that, that sort of thing. Like um, if you don't get, you know, there's a lot of things, if you don't get it first time and working memory, it's all, all short term memory, they're, they're very critical things. Uh, to do with that direction, because working memory is when, you, again, you have to deal with directional change, not in exclusively, but it's one of those things. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that I thought was really interesting is the visual difficulties. Like a lot uh, of the math symbols look very similar. And if yeah, you're, you're yeah. struggling, they, they just kind of all blur together. Yeah. We, we um, had a psychologist in England. Again, I didn't know him. I didn't know of him. So I started in the field well, in the 80s. Um, and he wasn't really to do with his calculia or his lecture. He was mainstream. And he said, maths is all about symbols. It's as, it's as straightforward as that. And, you know, I always think it's a great shame in algebra we use the, the letter X for the unknown. And we make it a bit curly so you don't get it confused with the multiplication sign. Yeah. Like, like that'll work, <laughs> and, and you know what? What can you do with X and two, um, and, and where you put it? You know that visual things. But equally, although I know I'm maybe going slightly off tack, in maths we don't like to use visual explanations of theory. So although visual can be a problem, they can be an awful big help as well. So, but I think the visuals around symbols, yeah. And, and symbols that are hidden. Yes. yes. So they're visuals that you can't see. <laughs> <laughs> so the division sign in, um, in a fraction, you know. Yes. And you I can't... think math is so tricky too, like with the vocabulary, I, there's a sentence or something in your book where you talk about third and third, like third as in third place, third as in the fraction. <laughs> third yeah. position, you yeah. know. <laughs> it, it's, um, yeah, <laughs> it, it is, it is strange. Um, I, I've done quite a lot of work in Ireland. I just love going to Ireland. 
you know, anybody asks me to go to Ireland, I go. Um, of course, there, the, and the accent in the Irish, and I'm not in any way being rude to them, they, they tend to say not 33, but dirty three. And I think, and then sometimes it sounds like dirty tree. And so you've got to think about accents as well as just the regular clear English language that I use. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And it's so tricky to figure out where the errors are coming from and yeah, how, yeah. how they're manifesting and what can we do to change it. It's yeah, um, I think a, a lot of the errors are very commonly occurring. And, you know, it, you, it's very hard to be perfect in life. And if we can mop up a lot of the errors, then we'll save a lot of um, mistakes, a lot of poor marks for our students. You know, um, perfection, again, is, is a strange concept, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm a great believer in um, understanding error patterns. You have another guy in, in the States. You've got all the good people in the States. <laughs> well, near, a lot of them anyway. See, the only good one we had was Joyce Steves, and she went over to you as well. <laughs> um, but Bob Ashlock, who did Error Patterns in Computation, uh, 11 editions that book made. It is just mm -hmm. it's not a big book, but by gosh, is it wonderful. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I was curious, uh, in your book, you were talking about, we should be mindful about what needs to be memorized. And Amy and I have talked about that a lot, um, because the mantra in most schools is, well, all of it, all of it needs to be memorized. Yeah, you think, you know, I, this is something that people, some people have been aware of for decades. And but you wanted um, a funny story at some stage. This is not a funny story. This is a sad story. And in my first lesson with these kids I mentioned, my first ever lesson in maths with a dyslexic group, I discovered that they didn't know their times table facts. And I thought, with no knowledge whatsoever. I'll teach them the times tables. I'll make sure they learn these. They'll listen to me being happy and cheerful, and motivating. And so I, I started to do the chanting and the repetition. And after about 10 minutes, one lad who was a tad vulnerable um, got up from his desk, walked over to the classroom wall and banged his head on the wall. And I thought, you know, my best mate's a behavioral scientist. I'll ask him what this means. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've never recovered from the guilt I felt from doing that. And that was the most graphic, most dramatic uh, feedback I've ever had. Mm. And people still, and, and in England, I've even had a government rep come and ask me, come and talk to me about this, which I guess is something, except he didn't really listen. <laughs> um, you know, we still test 10 year olds on their times tables facts, multiplication facts. And it's, it's crazy. I mean, I was, that kid banged his head on the wall in 1981. And I feel like in some way it's quite appropriate that I'm still banging my head on the wall <laughs> in 2022 with this particular issue. And, and over the years, because I um, found in my own school in England, um, the, the lads, because it, it, it was predominantly lads that, had the, that were identified. And they'd come in and I'd say, how are you getting on the times tables then? Which is not a threatening question usually. So, oh, not bad. And I say, well, which ones you're in? You're really good at. Back would come the answer, two, five, ten. <laughs> and the smart ones would say one, and the really smart ones would say zero. Um, <laughs> and in the end, I almost stopped asking it because it was pretty much without exception. 
And if you think about coinage, and there's another, you talked about visual things. Why is your five cent coin smaller than your 10 cent coin, Americans? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It yeah. grows off everyone consistently. <laughs> yeah. And in Australia, the $2 coin is smaller than the $1 coin. You know, visual feedback's not good. Um, anyway, if, if you know 1, 2, 5, 10, and you know place value, you can work everything else out. And the added bonus of that is you are teaching decomposition of numbers. You're teaching partial products. So if you want to do seven of something, you do five and two, and then you add them together. But then you see, if you know that seven's five and two, you know a bit more about seven. Mm -hmm. It's not just the number that comes between six and eight. And that principle will carry you through to long multiplication because you've just done partial products. And so in addressing uh, a problem, which is there, um, you're actually addressing it, not by something that doesn't work, but you're addressing it by something that has fringe benefits. And I've, I've lectured for many, many years now to teachers, and not just in England, but I ask, uh, at the age of 10, what percentage of your pupils know all their times tables? And the modal answer is 70%. Mm. Uh, and then just in case that 30% that are doing well, we get them to recall it quickly, we put a bit of pressure on them and a bit of anxiety, which reduces their work in memory. And so we can make it even more of a failure. It's, it's, it's a skill some teachers have, you know, it's almost a natural ability. In them. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I would love to have Amy share. She's got a student that's been struggling with just basic math facts. And yeah. we were talking about having her go backwards to just let's focus on decomposition. Amy, do you want to kind of explain your plan and see, and get it yeah. from Steve? Yeah, that would be great. So I have a student who's a seventh grader and she's been struggling with math for a while. Um, and I've realized that it really comes down to her basic addition facts yeah. more than anything else right now. Yeah. Um, she, if she was going to add eight plus four, she's gonna count on and say nine, 10, 11, 12. And she uses her fingers, which I don't have a problem with. I don't, I don't think that using fingers is a problem. You have them, you can use them, that's okay. But um, she's not breaking anything apart. She's, she has no strategy. In fact, I've seen her take a, a larger number for a simple division problem and she'll write down little tallies and then group you know, things together. And so long story short, I realized that this problem needs to be addressed. The, the what Mahesh would call the 45 site facts that, and then the ones above that, that she doesn't have. And so we, I've decided to go backwards um, and I introduced the Cousinet rods with her yesterday just to get familiar with them. And then we're gonna use those to get down her 45 site facts. And then when, once we get above those into you know, the tens, then we'll, we'll use that decomposition and recomposition and put things back together. And then we'll use that same strategy for multiplication. And she knows, just like you said, her ones, her twos, her fives, her tens. But although she's very honest that there are, there's one, two she doesn't know, uh, two times nine <laughs> or nine times two. <laughs> okay. And no. there's, I think there was one five that she mentioned she doesn't know, so. Uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, it's, oh, well, you, you give her lots of good wishes from me. Um, <laughs> I like, I like queers and air rods. They're, they're like a lot of, um, stuff comes, doesn't it? Not just in math, stuff in education comes into fashion for a while and then it drops out of fashion. Quiz and air rods are beautifully sophisticated. I do like them. And not, well, they are so good for composition, but I do like, as you probably know, since you 
you know, doing the course. I do like the 10 as five and five, like the five pattern on, on a domino or a playing card. Um, because again, if, if you look at playing cards, um, they're actually very good with one, two, five and 10, apart from six, which they do as two, threes, three, twos. Um, and I like teaching nine um, by using 10 um, because that's estimation. And then they got to count back to get the nine fact. So they're practicing that. Mm -hmm. So they're doing a bit of reversing. Uh, and I love the question, is it bigger or smaller? When you look at an answer or an estimate. Because it's very difficult to get that wrong twice in a row. Mm. That's, <laughs> That's true. true. The, yeah, the cues in their rods had, were were made masterfully, like with the colors and yeah. yeah there, there, yeah. there's a lot more to them than just looking at yeah. them that you would yeah. suspect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you can take them to decimals, mm -hmm. fractions. They're fractions. great for fractions. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's in a way. I talk sometimes about cognitive style, and you know, um, because they don't have gradations, they're not like your finger counting, which you mentioned. They're they're more wholesome, if I can use the wrong word. Um, you've got to get the big picture, and you've yes. got to you've got to look and like if you compare six and four to five and five, you can see that it's six and four. And it, it's developing another picture of number values in the learner's head. If, if you do the dots that I just mentioned, they can sneakily count them, or they learn to recognize five and one more or six. So th there's lots of ways you can improve children's perception of number. And you can, I think you can get shades of, no, can you say shades of gray? No, because of the bad movie. You can say, <laughs> You could say, you can get crease in air rods and shades of grey, but may, for older kids, but you might have to be careful how you introduce it. Yes. My student yesterday told me that these things, I want to change the colors. I want to paint them different colors. I said, well, yeah. there, there, there are certain colors for a reason. We'll learn that later, so please don't paint them. <laughs> if you want to invent your own, yeah. your own crease and air rods, Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah and it, it, again, it's the same with the base 10, isn't it? You buy the plastic ones, they're bright colors, mm -hmm. but you can get wooden ones. And the wooden ones, as one of my lads told me once, he picked up the plastic one, thousand, you know, and he said, that doesn't feel like a thousand. <laughs> so I had, exactly. to go and buy, I had to go and buy wooden ones. <laughs> so all these different... Um, well, you know, the, the, the dyslexia was so far ahead of us, you know, with the mm -hmm. VAKT or whatever acronym you use, um, the different ways of getting stuff into the brain. Um, it very, still is, yeah. Yeah, that, that's just so important. I, mean, I mentioned I used to teach physics when I started. And if I was teaching physics and an inspector came in, and I wasn't using visuals, I'd fail. Mm. But the same doesn't apply to maths. And the subjects are so closely related. And I don't, under, it's like learning the times tables. I don't understand why visuals are just not a natural part of a lesson. Mm -hmm. Visual images. And these days with computers, you can do such wonderful things on a screen. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, absolutely can. So in all the years that you've worked with students, what do you think is the biggest misconception about these, these learners that struggle with mathematics? Wow. Gosh. Um, I might have to go to more than one biggest, which okay. is very grammatically incorrect. <laughs> I think that sounds great. <laughs> um, I think rote learning is, is not a, it is such a non-productive way of teaching. 
I think zero causes lots of problems and you, that won't come as a surprise to any maths teacher. Um, the Romans, the ancient Romans, I live in Bath and mm -hmm. Bath is a Roman city. So I go around, you see lots of numbers in Roman digits. And I, I always say to my wife, look, no zeros. Says, You've told me that 346 times <laughs> this week. <laughs> um, so I think zero is a problem um, because it's kind of a funny idea, really, isn't it? Having a symbol for nothing. Mm -hmm. and, for like, and I remember as an 11 year old at, at school, the teacher kind of snuck in a zero at the end of a maths lesson and didn't tell us. Mm. Um, um, I think we must have been boringly uh, intelligent in those days. I've grown out of it now. Um, <laughs> we talked about this for quite a while, and then the next day he explained it. But it's a very bizarre concept, and we mustn't be surprised. But I, so just ask me the question again, Adrian. Yeah, so what do you think are the biggest misconceptions? Yeah. Okay, so zero is one. Algebra is a problem. The sudden use of letters. Um, and the misconception for me is that they don't relate how the letters act like digits mm -hmm. and numbers. They don't get that concept. So those would be my two. What about you, you two in your experience? Yeah, I would say same kind of same kind of thing. Um, another common misconception is, well, fractions, but get that oh, idea yeah. of getting smaller yeah. and that the, that big number in the denominator is little. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. Is, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that inconsistency again, you see, isn't mm -hmm. it? Because mm -hmm. two, three, four, five has always meant getting bigger. Today, kids, it means getting smaller, okay? Exactly. <laughs> And, and accept me. it because I said so. Yeah, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> trust me, I'm a teacher. <laughs> exactly. Oh, it's too funny. Um, I was curious, too, are you planning on releasing any future editions and updating your, your book here, my favorite book? I know this is... The oh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to update that now. Um, Richard Ashcroft, who wrote that with me... Um, He's, he's still around, but he had heart problems, so he hasn't actually done much lately with that. So I'm, I'm on my own with it now, although I keep his name on because he's such a wonderful guy. So I don't know. I'm going to probably, although I'm, it's, there's the um, diagnosis book. There's, um, there's a youngish researcher, everything is relative, of course, called Kinga Mosani who now works at the Mass Education Department in Loughborough in England, which is big. It's, it's the education department in the university. And she's just um, analysed all my data from the standardised test mm. and done standard scores for me. And a lot of people, well, I say a lot, quite a few people ask me, should I have, can I have standard scores with your tests? And I say, well, I'll, I'll think about it. But... Percentile scores, um, people understand them much better. You can't say to a parent, your child has a standard score of 93 um, and expect them to know what it means. But if you yeah. say if you say they're in the fourth percentile, well, very gently and not spring it on them, <laughs> it, it, has, it has meaning. Not good meaning, of course. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when you're dealing with teachers or with sometimes with psychologists, sadly, and certainly with people who fund um, special needs, you've got to say, this kid's at the full percentile, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> <laughs> it, it just, it's just got more zap to it, hasn't it? So, exactly. so I, might, I might look at a fourth edition of that, but my data's getting a little bit older now, so, mm. and it's such a, you know, it's big data. But Kinga, Kinga Mosani is going to do a multiple choice version of my test. Oh. Um, as a screener. That's, that would be great. Yeah. 
And she's just so very, very, oh, she's just so clever. She, I, when I talk to her, I come away afterwards and think, you should retire, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you would love to retire. <laughs> so, um, so that will come out and it'll, um, you know, and I, <clears throat> I was always impressed in the States um, that the, um, what was then the dominance of multiple choice questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. And how uh, I had to do a course at Hopkins because of the nature of what the, the package they want you to do on um, legal aspects of special needs, which is not going to be my forte. And the multiple choice questions, the way they're worded, they're just wow. You need a degree to understand the question. Yeah. And you yes. need another degree to provide the answer. So, um, yeah. I would agree. I would agree. Um, we're actually going to interview, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Shin's work. She's um, here at Purdue and she wrote a program about solving word problems, but she's originally from China and was saying uh, the English way of writing word problems is quite ridiculous. <laughs> and yeah. so she created a program to help us address um, all of the issues around that. It's fantastic. Right. I've, I've trained half of my team on it. We're going to no. train the other half to start using it so that you yeah. don't have to have a degree in English to understand yeah. the word problem. <laughs> yeah. I used to. I haven't done it with Amy's lot. I used, when I did word problems in, in, in a training course, when I got to the word problem bit, I used to say, OK, eight minus five write me a word problem for eight minus five. The most ridiculous word problem, which is still ethically reasonable, and I'll be the decider, gets a prize. And um, <laughs> a rubber nut. I love it. <laughs> Because I think you should take word problems very seriously. Uh, <laughs> but there was some research done by um, um, uh, a postgraduate, and she looked at word problems a long time ago. But even, and again, you come back to words and predictability. If you say, what is eight minus five, the digits come in the right order. But if you say take five from eight, you've reversed them. And she found that that had an impact on the percentage of correct scores mm -hmm. in her screening. So word problems, yeah, I, I, I mock word problems. <laughs> <laughs> They're the most ridiculous I, thing. <laughs> they are. Oh, it's you know, the only it's... time where someone buys 575 watermelons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> brings them, brings them home in the lorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad because it, it, it is. Um, you can make. Maher Sharma says, um, as you probably know, that we rarely teach that thing I've just explained, where you take a number sentence and convert it into a word problem. Mm -hmm. Whereas in a foreign language, you wouldn't just teach English to Spanish, you teach Spanish to English. Mm -hmm. that's and he, that's one of the things he puts forward. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I love that. But well, he, our hasn't, time he, hasn't got my English, he hasn't oh, got go my English. He hasn't got my English sense of humor. So <laughs> I like it. I like your English <laughs> sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> well, as our time is wrapping up, I would just love to hear what other interesting projects are you working on? I know you have this class you're teaching with Amy, and I know there are not very many U.S. citizens in that class. Um, no, so let's no. see if we can increase that for you, but tell, tell us a little more about that class. Well, well the, 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 the class. Yes. Or the, it's just great. Um, I mean, one, one wouldn't have done that without COVID. Uh, it was COVID that forced us into that. And we do these Sunday meetings, which is a sort of a compensation for people just listening to lectures. They get some interaction with us. And 
I, and I'm not saying this just because of Amy. They are such good questions we get asked. We really do. And, you know, like I said, I learn from my pupils all the time. But now I'm learning from teachers because in those sessions, although they're Zoom, you actually get more feedback than when I do a lecture face to face. Because, you know, they ask a question, everyone's listening. And, and it's kind of, yeah, it's great. It's, 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 it's sharing. I learned how to share when I was in America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me the structure of the course. I know it's a longer in nature. It's a, it's a big, big course. <laughs> well, it, it's, um, it's kind of logical, I think. Now, God, I'm going to have to try and remember what it is now. That's, that's a bit of... <laughs> so, actually, I'm, the, 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 the new book I'm writing is kind of similar. So, we, we look at what dyscalculia is or might be, because, again, I, I'm, it's not clean cut. I've, um, Amy may not have seen it yet, but I did one about assessment where I look and saying, when you're assessing people, it's not like me doing an experiment when I taught physics. People aren't as predictable or as consistent or as reliable. <laughs> I don't mean that in a, in a, um, a non-complimentary way. So we look at dyslexia, we look at the characteristics because a lot of the stuff you do in a lesson is not actually what you teach, it's the way you teach it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when I did my teacher training, which was God knows, so many years ago, um, we, we did a bit on working memory, but not much. We didn't really get told it, how important it was. Very little on short-term memory. Um, very little about, I'm, I'm quite interested in, um, so just the general talk in a classroom. So I look at classroom management and, and things like setting homework. It, man, teaching is such a massive skill. And then you look at the basic facts, like we just discussed addition facts, times table facts, and how we can make those not just a rote learning exercise. And I look at lots of visualization for the fractions and the long division, because those are the two things that in my work, I found kids don't like. That's, they're the worst ones. And then we do word problems. So we do kind of like, um, I guess the mass that kids will meet up to about the age of 13, 14. We don't do things, we don't have a pre-algebra course in England, mm. for example. So, but I do some early algebra, linking it and showing how it develops. And like I say, I, and I like, I'm also very interested in cognitive style and metacognition, which was work I did when I was in the States with my two colleagues there. Um, um, and um, diagnosis. And I, I, I teach diagnosis not just for itself, but to try and put a diagnostic feed into people's brains. So they're kind of aware of diagnosing as they teach. So looking for the error patterns, like we said very early on. So it, it's a very pragmatic course. I love the word pragmatic. Um, mm -hmm. It's got theory, but it's primarily pragmatic. It's things, we have a phrase in England, if you have in the States, teachers want to know what to do on Monday. Um, but I think, you know, there's another five days in the week um, and I'd like them to, get everything, look at all the different impacts that affect your students, affect the way you teach them, affect the way they learn, and listen to your students. If you don't listen to your students, you'll be a rotten teacher for the rest of your career. <laughs> I might as well tell you how it is, you know? True, yeah. Yeah, you have to be willing to adjust how you're doing things to make sure the input is actually helpful for that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, you you're a teacher so many things. And I mentioned in passing my uh, oldest mate. Um, 
Uh, yeah, he's only my oldest mate because he's the same age as me. He's a behavioral psychologist. Um, did way back in the 60s, lots of stuff on facial expressions and body language. And really, that ought to be part of any teacher training course. It really should. You know, it's, um, there's so much involved in teaching. It is the most underestimated profession in the Agreed. world. Agreed. Agreed. It's, it's an art <laughs> and a science. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. everything. It's all of it encompassing. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I used to like, um, again, like I said about fashions, transactional analysis. I thought that was brilliant. Um, it's where you look at um, a discussion, uh, a transaction between people, and you analyze what, what your impact is on them, what their impact is on you. Yeah. Great stuff. Great stuff. Well, it's been just a joy to have you, Dr. Chen. Um, <laughs> we'll have you back. I think we should do this again sometime. Uh, I'm boring. I tell the same stories. I've got to yeah, tell you a story good. before I go, haven't I? Yes. <laughs> Let's hear your right. story. Okay. So it supports a lot of what I've just told you. So and this is quite in my early days. I'm, I'm working with this group of, um, there were 13. And there was this one lad uh, who um, was Swedish. And I mentioned that because he was also learning maths in, in a, a foreign language. Mm. Uh, but he was as sharp as a tack. And, and you know, as teachers, you don't want clever kids in your class. They're just a challenge, you know, they don't want it. So I'm doing rounding up and rounding down with the group, you know, and so I'm I've got to keep my eye on him. I'm doing like one kid, I'll say 68, and they'll say 70. Good, 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 good. 23, 20. Brilliant, brilliant. So I get to Benny, and I haven't told him the rule. And I say, 55. And he looks at me and he says, are you buying or selling? <laughs> And that is just <laughs> so, so clever. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought, yeah, don't get caught out by this kid. <laughs> I, no, I, I, just, I, I admired him greatly. He was a wonderful kid to teach. Oh, I'm sure. I think that's one of mine and Amy's favorite things. You never know what's going to come out of these kids' mouths. No. And it's a joyful, fun experience. We have no. a lot of fun around here. It should be. It should be. Yes. <laughs> well, oh. thank you again for being with us. And we'll have you back thank again. Thank you. Great to talk with you both. See you, Amy. <laughs> thank you. I won't be able to join on Sunday, but I'll see you next month. <laughs> okay. Well, that next month I shall have been in Greece um, for 10 days. So I, I will be oh, very nice. tanned and bronzed. <laughs> we'll have fun in Greece. <laughs>